you everyone for joining us today for our virtual event. I'm Israel Wisner, the Eastern Region Account Executive at CSAP, part of the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. Together with our friends at Ethicon, we're grateful to have you here with us today to discuss leveraging digital tools to enhance surgical training. Over the course of this discussion, please comment with your questions and experiences in the Q&A box below so that we can touch on these live with our guest speaker. With that, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Robert Serfolio, world-renowned thoracic surgeon and educator. Dr. Serfolio is the Executive Vice President, Vice Dean, Chief of Hospital Operations, and Chief of Clinical Thoracic Surgery at NYU <clears throat> Langone Health. He is also the Director of Perlmutter Cancer Center's Lung Cancer Center and past president of the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association. Dr. Serfolio, welcome, great to see you. And we're honored to have you and very much appreciate you making the time to join us. Well, Israel, thank you. The honor is mine to have your time and your audience's time. We know how busy everybody is and the single greatest commodity in our life really is time. So I'm honored to have that, thank you. Thank you. And with us today from the CSATS team is Mike Knox. Mike is the commercial director for the Eastern Region at CSATS. He will be kicking off this discussion with Dr. Serfolio. Over to you, Mike. Hey, thank you very much, Israel. Much appreciated. And uh, Dr. Serfolio, so wonderful to connect with you this evening. And look, before we dig into this discussion, and with these very unprecedented times, as we know, I, I want to just check in with you and your family and make sure you guys are doing okay through this COVID crisis so far. That's kind of you, Mike. And uh, actually, it's been the greatest privilege of my professional life to serve the doctors, the nurses, the staff, and everyone here at NYU Langone from March on. You know, we have done 48,000 COVID tests. Now we're up to 120. Uh, we admitted over 1,200 COVID patients. I got to round on uh, six or 700 of them every day here in our Manhattan hospital. Uh, and we're all fine and healthy and well. I can't seem to get this damn thing even if I tried, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, uh, first of all, I'm glad to hear that you, you've not picked it up yet, that's for sure. But uh, no question, New York uh, City, certainly been in the midst of it all, NYU on, on the front lines. And look, from, from all of us at J&J &J and CSATS, we want to extend our gratitude and appreciation, not just to you, Dr. Serfolio, and your colleagues, but all healthcare providers, right? For the, I for the compassion and commitment yeah. to patient care. Yeah, it's been outstanding. Amazing effort of leadership. And, you know, um, it's nice that some of the healthcare professionals are getting uh, recognized with the 7 p.m. sirens and clapping. They really have put their patients in front of their own safety, especially when this started and people were so afraid. Uh, the amazing stories of leadership and, and heroes are especially the nurses. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard many of those. And uh, once we start, obviously, interacting with, uh, with our healthcare systems, I'm sure we'll hear many of those as well. But uh, hey, what do you say we kind of kick things off here? And let's, uh, let's introduce our discussion today around surgical training. And I thought we'd start with you, right? Your perspective on the biggest challenges you see today. I think the biggest challenges is uh, people don't take feedback well. Now, you probably didn't think I was going to go there, but and it's not just surgeons, it's true of administrators and everybody. Feedback is a gift, even if it's completely wrong. Even if they tell you it's raining and it's sunny outside, sit and listen, because there's some value. They wouldn't be telling you if it's raining if there wasn't maybe rain in the forecast. So I think uh, not just because of egos, but because of the silos we live in, we really all think we're absolutely the best in the world at everything we do. When you get outside of your silos, or you find ways to measure it with this new efficient, this efficiency quality index that we generated here that really is very specific to everything you do. We have it for our cooks that make hamburgers, and it's different than our cooks that make spaghetti. But it me and that's literally true. It measures quality and efficiency in everything you do. All of a sudden, you realize, I'm just average, and I want to get better. How do I get better? Well, it's interesting. I, I think back, and I know you have a sports background as well, and I had a coach back in the day that, that said, look, if you're not getting better every day, you've got two directions you're going to go. You're either moving forward or guess what? You're moving backward. You're not staying idle. There's no question about it. So it's right. encouraging to hear that the culture there at NYU is all about striving for excellence. So good, good stuff there. So out of curiosity, what, what have you heard from fellows and residents in terms of their own challenges through this time? And I, and I think, you know, each generation gets better than the one before. I'm tired of hearing I walk to school uphill both ways and this new generation. I heard that when I was a kid. Now I hear it. I'm 58. 
us saying about the fellows. The doctors now are going to be better doctors than us. They're going to be better parents. They're going to be better children. They're going to be better uncles, and they're going to be better at everything. Uh, but they do have a different view of the world, and they do have a different view of work-life balance. They put that fulcrum in a different part. We need to listen and listen carefully to them and then leverage that to make them the best physicians that they can be and the best people that they can be. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good comments there and good, good food for thought. I'm curious, have they started expressing concern about um, OR time or, or concern about meaningful mentorship opportunities and, and FaceTime with attendings like yourself? Have they brought that up at this point? They have, and I think here at NYU Langone, we're no different than most centers where we think mentor, mentoring and mentorship, formal programs along with formal leadership programs is really, really important. And we're probably doing it in a much more formal way than they did back when I was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic where I had some of the world's best mentors and I was honored to be taught by them. But the teaching style is a little different. You know, I, I just recently wrote a little article about you know, there may be five or six different love languages, but there are five or six different teaching languages as well. And we all respond to coaching and teaching in different way. So a really, really good teacher understands the language that that student listens to and responds to better. And I, you know, I was in the OR uh, on Monday with a fellow who I could whip and go to the whip and say, you're terrible, get better. And had a fellow yesterday, I said, hey, you're doing a great job. That's great. Maybe use a little more bipolar. Then I spread a little bit. Very and the nurse said, I can't believe you're the same guy. Well, I am the same guy, but I teach differently for different fellows or junior attendings. Yeah, it's impressive to hear the importance you put around adapting to different uh, behavioral styles, so to speak, of your of your fellows and your attendings. And great food for thought. And you know, it's interesting. We we've got quite uh, an initiative around academic medical centers right now here at CSATS, and we've been talking to a lot of program directors of late, um, as well as attendings. And one of the things that they continue to allude to is that. The surgical opportunities, look, there's just less shots on goal right now, right? To use a sports analogy and, and yep. that incorporating digital solutions seem to be more necessary than ever to help support and enhance surgical training in today's world. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, first of all, I think you're right. You can't, te you can't watch one, do one, teach one anymore, and you can't learn from your own mistakes. Uh, I told the fellow yesterday, you got to learn from my mistakes. No, mistakes are not tolerated anymore. And I think that they were more tolerated in the past. So there may be as many shots on net, but you can't have any unforced errors uh, to finish your analogy. But so it's all about better preparation. There's no better way to prepare for an operation than to watch it. Reading a textbook is what I did. It's mm -hmm. ludicrous. You need to watch it. You need to watch the different styles and understand the anatomy uh, and really get the anatomy cold and then the different ways to dissect. I mean, I, we're even breaking down a surgeon into different categories. There's sweepers, there's dissectors, there's boviers, there's pullers, there's tuggers. There's all different types of ways to dissect. And there, it's like having golf clubs in a golf bag. You need them all, but it's which one you select at which time that makes you a good surgeon or not. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about those, those things you just mentioned, I'm curious, Dr. Serfolio, what are some ways that, that you're personally leveraging technology to address some of these issues and concerns? Yeah, so what we started doing maybe about 10 or 11 years ago was uh, breaking operations down like a, a right upper lobe. We broke down into 47 different steps. And we did a little video vignette for each step. I did that when I was doing open surgery. God, that was back in, that was 13 years ago, if you can imagine. And now we've done the same thing uh, with robotic surgery. What I say is, if you can't get, do step 17, then we take step 17 and we break that into three or four small components. And you look at the videos and say, here how we're accomplishing that step. It's no different than I taught my kids how to hit a baseball, how to switch it, throw a, throw a slider. It's the same thing. You break it down into individual parts. And some students need to see step 17 into eight parts. And some, oh, I put my fingers and I rotate it off. And I get a splitter like that. And they can throw it right away. So different skill levels and different talent for different people. But I think that's the way to do it. And it is video review for sure. Yeah, the, the video review, and I, I heard you mention earlier about the feedback and surgeons sometimes are challenged potentially with the ego and they think they're the greatest and so forth and so on. Yeah. Um, how, is, how are those types of reviews internally at NYU, how are they received in general? <clears throat> so we probably, um, and I say this with all modesty because this is my boss, Dr. Grossman, our CEO and leader who's created this, this amazing culture here. 
we are the most metricized organization in the world. So I meet with uh, the eight or nine lung surgeons and we look every month at their quality metrics, length of stay, operative time, blood loss, number of lymph nodes, number of N1, N2 lymph nodes, uh, patient satisfaction score, nurses rating of you, fellows ratings of you, and you get a score in EQI, efficiency quality index for lobectomy. And we see who are the winners, who are the losers, and we, it's wide open, and we do this every single uh, quarter. And it's, um, it's made us better. And it's also helped us tell a few people, hey, maybe you're not best at lobectomy. You're gonna do esophageal, or you're gonna do pectus, or you're gonna do uh, Operation X. And it drives excellence through transparency and accountability. Egos are checked at the door. Yeah, and I think what's impressive about, again, the culture that you continue to reference there is, is the patient's always at the center. I mean, obviously, you're looking for the high, highest quality outcomes there. 100%. It's uh, what are we here for? We're here for the patients. We're not here for your ego or your CV. So yeah. when you do that uh, and you have open conversations that some of the physicians haven't had here in 30 or 40 years, and they're, they're a little more resistant to it than, than the other ones, it, uh, it's amazing how we became a three-star lobectomy program by the SDS rating thing literally in six months, because we drove excellence towards a target. And the target for that was three star for STS. For the hospital, it's the Vizient. US News and World Report's a little tricky because they don't really look at outcomes. They look at how good you look in your uniform called reputation factor. That's baloney. I don't care how the hell you look in the uniform. I don't care how the hell you hit the baseball. So Vizient is, a, is an organization that looks at really how well you perform in terms of mortality, length of stay, and NYU Langone is one or two or three every year of the last seven years. Wow. We're proud of that. Very impressive, and, and, and you should be proud of that. And, and look, you, you've had a couple of references to sports, and I know you're an athlete yourself. And in fact, they've written an entire book, right, on advancing from a super performer to a star performer. So, so in a nutshell, give us some perspective. What's your perspective on the parallel between professional athletes and busy surgeons? <laughs> and do surgeons should be seeking this coaching in the manner of, of professional athletes. Why not? I mean, I could, uh, what I probably should do is uh, even put this up and tell you, let me ask you a question. Did this guy have a coach? <laughs> Absolutely. He, did. Yeah, he sure the hell did. He's the greatest basketball player ever to play LeBron. You're my man, maybe you or Michael, one or the other. But um, the point is why do the world's best athletes have coaches and the day I finish residency, all of a sudden I look in the mirror and I'm 6'4 and good looking with a full set of hair. Nothing I have, but that's what I see. And I just go out and practice and not be coached. So we should all have coaches until the day we die, not just as surgeons, but also as people, uh, how we can listen better, a skill that I'm still working on, but I'm getting a much better now than I was a few years ago. Still got a way to go. I want to get better. How I can be a better father, uh, how I can be better to my significant other now. My wife passed away seven years ago, and that's a new role for me, uh, how to have someone else in my life that's not my wife, how I can do that better. It's, it's all these things about wanting to get better as a person every day and really um, modeling excellence and really doing it in all parts of life, not just in the OR or getting a winner against Cleveland like you did there. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, and I do, I appreciate the parallels that, uh, that, you, that you illustrate, obviously, between life in general, right, and our professional, our professional lives as well. And uh, right. yeah, I mean, look, if, if, if we're not striving for perfection, if we're not chasing excellence, I mean, why be in the race, right, at the end that's, of the day? That's correct. And I think that's what CSATS allows you to do. You know, this particular platform you all have created here does exactly that. It allows you to go into other people's silos watch how they're operating and say, oh my God, this guy really is better than me. I mean, this, this woman or this man is, is a better surgeon. Look how they're doing this. I never knew you could take the number seven lymph node on the left side this way. I never knew you could dig out the A6 pulmonary artery to the superior segment of the left lower lobe from the back. I was always fissure diving from the front or whatever it is. The video, you know, ball don't lie, video don't lie but textbooks can lie a little. <laughs> the big eye in the sky doesn't lie, right? We, we, we right. know that. Right. So uh, it, it's interesting, you know, you, you bring up CSATs and one of the things that we continue to challenge ourselves with is really to evolve a platform that appeals to all surgeons, no matter where they are in their career. So, so as a very proficient, 
right? Highly, highly proficient thoracic surgeon. What role do you see? I mean, I'm thinking that you're an expert reviewer for CSATs as well. What role do you see CSATs playing in somebody at your level? At any, any level. Are you kidding? I want to get better. If I'm not better tomorrow, I'm a bum. Like you said, where are you going? I'm going on the bench. So I, I said yesterday in the OR, we, we did this operation that well went well. And unfortunately, my very good teammate, my NP said, because we had a few visitors watching remotely, that's as good as you can do it. I went ballistic with that. Because the second you start navel gazing and looking in the mirror and thinking you're that good, I said, listen, there's some guy in Singapore right now doing push-ups and doing robotic simulation who's better than you and I. We better, we better get better. So uh, I think it helps you in so many different ways. And I think the ideal way, the next iteration of CSATs would be if I'm in an OR doing a case, can I thumbnail to this part of the operation and look intraoperatively at a video and watch a master surgeon somewhere do this part while I, I wait a 30 seconds say, hey, I should flip the lung and do this or that. So not just beforehand, because certainly the night before you allow us to do that by giving us links to vignettes and videos, but even intraoperative educating, or you have a coach that comes into your OR and it helps you through it. What does that lead to? Better patient outcomes. And yeah. that's what we're all here for. I mean, those are, those are excellent suggestions, excellent remarks, and uh, we appreciate the challenge. We'll continue to work to, to evolve towards that type of platform for sure. In terms of, Dr. Cerfolio, the, the video review itself that you've mentioned, um, I mean, we've got some program directors, we've got some fellows and residents on here. What, what guidance or, or on frequency and approach would you offer those individuals, the fellows, the residents, program directors, so that they can obviously effectively sharpen their operative skills as well? So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, give you a, a, a um, advice to sharpen what you give us. So you take a two hour operation, you may break it into three 10 minute intervals. There may be other ways to do that better. One, two, and then on our end, on our end, <clears throat> we need to be more vigilant in watching these videos. You know, it is every doctor out there, a program director listening to this is like, Hey, it sounds great. How do you do it? We ask the resident to do it at home at night on their own because they only have so many hours they're allowed to work. Sure. It'd be great if you could block off a Friday afternoon like I used to be able to do for an hour to do video review of whatever that particular fellow was struggling with. And we did that for maybe a year. It was hard. It, we couldn't sustain it. And now I'm, I'm a COO and doing other things. But ideally, it's to really embed video review weekly into the educational program we do it a little bit in our didactic conference, but I mean tailored to each fellow with his or her mentor uh, on like a Thursday or Friday afternoon when things are calming down a little bit uh, before people go away for the weekend. Uh, that, that's great perspective and, and great uh, suggestion for sure. And thanks for sharing. So you, you, you had mentioned earlier on about, you know, taking these surgeons to the next level. You want these as an example, thoracic surgeons to be even better than you are. So you, you have a in, inherent passion, right, about serving and coaching trainees to become excellent surgeons. So keeping that surgeon educator hat on, what are some ways that you would recommend for how surgical program directors yes. can continue to improve their coaching and yeah. mentorship? So, and so I think uh, yeah. we, we need to be much more specific in how we grade people we're doing it. You can't grade them as a surgeon. Right now you have the content esophageal, right, and you have content ICU in the OR. It needs to be the part about the operating room has to be sort of broken out and made much more robust and go through the very specific steps of all the operations and to prove that someone is competent and credentialed they have to be able to meet all these parts of the operation. We're getting towards that, but not yet in a granular way. And we're, we're painting with too broad of a stroke. So I would recommend that, you know, so let's just stick with thoracic surgery lobectomy, segmentectomy, thymectomy, esophagectomy, that there are 20 intraoperative skills that you have to be able to show you can do both in a complex chest and a simple chest that you can accomplish these. And the video review is the way that we watch them do it and we score it. And, and you all have the platform to do that. Yeah, and, and has COVID-19 impacted your approach to that at all? So unfortunately, I've done about 15 operations on patients with COVID, but I think that's an exception. Uh, you know, and of course, our shut down our program for a few months. We only did maybe 20 or 30 lung resections over those few months, but we're back to full gear now. So I think COVID taught us how to be better doctors. 
uh, taught us how to operate on some unusual lung problems. But otherwise, I think it's just part of who we were, but I don't think it's going to change anything too much in surgical education. Yeah, no, and, and I, I really appreciate your thoughts there. And it's, it's quite impactful given what, what you've seen and done for COVID-19 patients. What, what would be your actionable advice for how residents and fellows can make the most of these challenging times while adapting their learning methods? Yeah, so this is what we did because we weren't operating electively. Now, we came up with a unique way to do trachs. We had 30 people go on ECMO. We had, you know, as 1,200 people in our hospital. We were very busy, but we felt like our cardiothoracic fellows weren't getting the reps they needed. We couldn't go to the lab at the time, but we did do video reviews with them then, going over the cases they had done and then reviewing what we thought was a much better way to do it and to really let them see what good looks like. Uh, so we actually leveraged video reviews a lot during COVID when we had some time. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, that sounds like the video review, that platform itself has uh, been extremely important to the time. Yep. No question. Well, hey, Dr. Serfolio, look, it's a privilege to discuss this critical subject with you. We hear stories of the resilience, you, you referenced it some, and the courage, quite frankly, of surgeons uh, at the front lines and countless unsung heroes behind the scenes. And there's challenges all around, right? All around the world, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and we especially appreciate your thoughts on how trainees and educators can uh, digitally, right, scale surgical coaching and mentorship. It's no question that's important. So now it's going to be time to hear from you, our audience, right, as well as from Dr. Sofolio. So up next, we're going to have our live Q&A with Dr. Sofolio as he touches on your questions and comments around enhancing surgical training with digital tools. We also welcome you to weigh in on a couple key polling questions. Right, you're going to have an opportunity to do that as well. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Sofolio, for our wonderful conversation. We appreciate it. Mike, my honor to spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Dr. Sofolio, for that uh, engaging discussion. Even as a layperson, there were some really great suggestions on performance that I took away from that conversation. Thank you. Appreciate so now. Thank you, Dr. Zerfolio. So now we'd like to hear from our audience. And as we've posted in the chat box, please use the Q&A um, uh, box at the bottom of your screen to um, submit your questions and comments for Dr. Zerfolio. And what I'd like to do now to engage, uh, to engage with the audience and to get your feedback and your own experiences, we're going to launch the following poll. And um, the question is, if you could uh, submit from the poll that's showing up on your screen now, how would you rate the quality and frequency of feedback you receive on your surgical performance? We've got four choices here, so please choose the one that you think is most relevant for you, and we'll give uh, the audience a few seconds here to vote. The first option is constructive, actionable feedback and good frequency. Second is constructive, actionable feedback, but not enough frequency. The third option is poor and or biased feedback. And then the last choice is that I don't receive feedback at this time. So we'd love to hear what your experience is like within your own organizations, within your own programs. And then these are all anonymous. Uh, we'll share the aggregated results with the audience here in a minute. Um, so just a few more seconds here and then we'll close the poll. Looks like we've got some good responses still coming in. So we'll give, um, give folks a few more seconds here to, um, to vote. And um, I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to share the results with you here. So here's an interesting, um, here are the interesting results here. 9% feel that they're getting constructive and good frequency in feedback. 41% feel that there's good feedback, but not frequent enough. 20% say bot poor and or biased. And then 31% of you have said you do not receive feedback. So Dr. Serfolio, what are your thoughts? Any, any reaction to those, well, to those I results? I think it cuts to the point that we could all get more feedback and it's really the, it's the time crunch and the ability, uh, really the opportunity to cut time out, carve time out to, to really critically evaluate what we're doing. You know, it's, it's too bad because we have the dividends in the bank and we just can't spend time to go to them and spend them the way we'd like to. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, you talked about before is, you know, you have this fantastic environment and culture within NYU um, of transparency and a metrics-driven organization, but right. some institutions are still trying to incorporate that. So 
you have any suggestions for how how to go about building a culture like that? You know, one well, where there's transparency and openness to feedback. Yeah, beware of the man giving uh, free advice. It's usually worth the price you're paying for it. And we can get a lot better ourselves. I think these are very hard conversations. Um, you know, we use this thing called the Efficiency Quality Index. It's something that I developed seven or eight years ago, and now we're using it for the whole institution. But it's what is your quality and how long does it take to do something? And it's really hard when you have 10 surgeons and there's two or three who are just much worse than the other. And then you have to sit down with them and say, listen, the EQI for lobectomy or segmentectomy is bad. You shouldn't do that. Maybe you should do pectus. Maybe you should do something else. And so it's very difficult conversations. But unless you get the data, uh, you can't do it. And unless you put time into delivering the data, then it doesn't work. So it is culture and it is a leadership that, you know, chairs are able to have difficult conversations with their faculty. Uh, and that's very hard to do. A lot of places don't do that well and they wait too long and then their outcomes aren't as good. And we're as guilty of this as other places, but we're much more transparent and open about it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's definitely a challenge. You know, the, the limitations in time, uh, you know, the, the number of hours in a day and the demands on surgeons, on attendings, and on residents, right? There's restrictions on the number of hours residents and, and, and uh, trainees uh, can, can be focused and can be learning. Which um, I'd like to comment you, on, just, just to keep it fun, that's communism. To me, that's communism. Don't come to my house and tell me I can't practice. So it's communistic and every resident listening should be against it. I understand the rules, but don't tell me I can't practice to get better, but that's what that is. So there's ways to practice at home on your own, especially with videos. So, um, so can an organization build that into their program or do they, is it really sort of the residents and the, the fellows, the trainees, even attendings who want to do video review is sort of on their own that they'd have to kind of build that in? No, I think it's incumbent on the program directors to see the value, and I think most do. We're surgeons, so we should absolutely see the value of reviewing uh, videos, our own videos, and carve it into our educational program. That's what we do. But it's very time consuming because you have to edit and get to the right part. You all do that for us. If we stand on CSAT's shoulders, it's done for us in many ways, which is why we subscribe and use it in our residency program, and also for credentialing, and then also for this issue, I'll, I'll talk about what happens to the aging or frailing or ill surgeon. It doesn't have to be age, it could just be competency, it could be after an accident or after an operation. Is he or she able to come back? And you can actually use objective metrics with CSAT scores to say, hey, I don't care that surgeon is 109 years old. Their score in CSATs is 21 for a Whipple, they can keep doing it. So it has a lot of value, CSATs, and what you're doing if people start using it in the appropriate way. Absolutely. Um, thank you for those comments uh, and, and we appreciate it. So here's a question from the audience. I'm a new thoracic surgeon about to do my first surgical coaching session this week. I have three videos of lobectomies I have to review. What should I focus on to get the most out of my training, my session? So it's great. So I would break it up to the beginning part, which is port placement that you might not have. CSAT wouldn't have that part unless you filmed it as you put it in. Uh, and then I always ask the, the particular resident or fellow for them to tell us because uh, the EQI has people put skin in the game because each doctor has their own data. They say it's correct. And then each doctor physician determines what's quality. I do the same thing here. I'll ask the resident fellow, where do you think you struggle the most? What part of the operation? And then we focus on that. That allows them to have skin in the game because we're listening to them we're hearing what they think we, they want to focus on in our limited time. So we allow the student to direct the tutorial to start. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, and, and so another question for you. Um, you know, you've talked about today earlier and, and in your book, you talk about super performers working to improve their game and, um, you know, always being improving. What tools have been helpful to you? in your training and your work on continuous improvement? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, going to the meetings, which unfortunately we don't have so much anymore, right? It's hard to go anywhere, but we'll get them back. And listening to other uh, physicians and leaders that I respect, really listening hard, which is a skill that I think we all have to work on. I certainly 
Uh, I have become a much better listener in the last five years and I still have a way to go, but really listening to other surgeons, other physicians, how they handle problems, how they educate, how they're more patient than I am, uh, and just other ways to do, sir, there's a thousand ways to do operations. And we should listen to, to one another, especially those that are very experienced and have great outcomes. Absolutely, great. All right, well, thank you. Um, we've got another poll here that we want to um, get the audience to react to. So I'm gonna launch our second poll. And uh, again, if you could submit your response. So this one is a multi-select question. So, um, and this is relating to what you said just a moment ago, Dr. Serpola. The question is, what is your preferred method of continued surgical learning? And please choose all the ones that are relevant for you. Is it surgical video review, textbooks, online peer forums, discussion groups, personal interactions with colleagues, peer-reviewed publications, and articles? So take a moment here and choose the ones that um, are most helpful to you. It looks like we're getting some great responses. So thank you for those who have voted. Um, and we'll give it a few more seconds. And then we're going to um, uh, share those results with you, with the, um, with the audience and, and with, the, with Dr. Serfolio today. And again, please continue to submit your questions. We're getting some great ones in the, the uh, question and answer box. So continue to submit your questions. We're monitoring those and we'll be posing them to Dr. Serfolio as our as our discussion continues here. So with that, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share these results with the audience. It looks like we've had some pretty substantial um, re uh, voting here. 77% uh, of, of those of you who have responded said that surgical video review is a way that you work on continued surgical learning. And then 73% said it's through personal interaction with colleagues, 42% peer reviewed publications, 35 with online peer forums. Um, and only 8% with textbooks. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and then Dr. Zafoglia get to you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's why I said last night when we were looking at the AATS planning committee that surgeons don't wanna travel and maybe not travel now, get on Zoom and hear an abstract on you know 10,000 people with one red eyeball and green hair that have a tumor in the left upper lobe. It's ridiculous <laughs> and a waste of time. They wanna hear how can I get a patient in the OR faster, do a routine lobectomy better, show me how you do it, and then let's talk about how we can do it at our place. Common problems we deal with every day. Uh, I think that's the real value, and that question cuts to it. You know, it's video because video don't lie, as we said before, it shows how you can do it in different ways, what instrument, what's technique. We've broken surgery into their sweepers, their dissectors, their spreaders, their burners. I'm trying to codify the way surgeons operate. And then that interaction, that listening, to world experts out there who can teach me how they do things and why. And I try to ask people when they're operating, can they talk? When I'm operating, I love to talk and explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. And every single move, I should have a reason. If I don't, I love when my visitors say, why are you doing that? And if I don't have an answer, they're my new best superhero because they're telling me I'm wasting their time and mine. So we should, die, we should have really good surgeons talk and narrate their thought patterns as they're operating. That's, those are the two 77 and 73% that people want to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, with in t today's environment, with everything being digital like we are today, we can really leverage uh, digital tools. We can really leverage uh, uh, the ability to interact with and relate to and talk with our colleagues virtually like we're doing today. It doesn't require being face to face or in person, right? So, um, you know, all of these resources are a real advantage or you know, a benefit in this environment. I agree. So, um, so uh, a question from the audience. What's your opinion on those that say the most important thing is the patient is safe and they're not welcoming of scores or metrics or feedback? How have you changed your practice to em embrace this or how do you respond to that? What, what are your thoughts, Dr. If the patient is sick, did you say? What? Safe, patient is safe. It's a great so they're saying the patient did well, they had a good outcome. Yeah, so you know, what, what's the balance of there? So it depends how you define outcome, right? So um, in our place, if you have a lobectomy or segment and don't go home on post-op day one, it's a failure. If you go home post-op day one with a chest tube in, it's a failure, and I still got 9% of those. The segment should go home the day of surgery the next day. Probably very few people listening would agree with me. That's our metrics. The bar used to be, be in the hospital a day or two, now it's one. We don't expect just safe. 
We don't expect back to work at two weeks. We want people back to work at five to seven days. We want them leaving the hospital at 24 hours or less. We want them off narcotics in two days. We just keep setting the bar higher and higher. So it depends what you define as good. Uh, we've gotten the bar so high that it's really good to be 100%. 100% perfect lobectomy is under 90 minutes. The resident gets to do the entire operation. You have five N2, three N1, at least 20 lymph nodes in the right chest, R0 resection, less than 10 cc blood loss. We're usually 15 or 20. We usually fail that. They go home the next morning by 8 a.m. without a chest tube. We fail that 10% of the time and they're cured for the rest of their life. So that metric goes for 20 years. So how do you define it? So I think it's where you put good. We put good really, really, really high. So we're always struggling to get there. Safe, we expect everyone. We expect the mortality to be zero for lobectomy and segment at 90 days. Anything under that's not acceptable. It may happen, but to us, it's unacceptable. Thank you. That's great. And, you know, I think um, it really speaks to what you've continued to point out and continue to hone in on it and reinforces this idea that we're never good enough, that we can always be better. We can better than we, we, even if we're number one, we can still be better than we were yesterday, right? That's right, because I wasn't sending people home just two years ago on post-op day one. I was sending them home really on post-op day two. I wasn't removing the chest tube the day of surgery until, uh, until I came to New York. I wasn't doing that in Alabama two years ago. We, uh, we give them some ice cream about four or five hours post-op, make sure they don't have a chylothorax. We use a digital air leak system. We pull the tube out. And that is all back on the video. How do you handle the fissure? How do you move, grab the lung so it doesn't leak remotely from where you stapled the lung when you're taking the lymph nodes? All that's in the video. How to handle the lung so there's no air leak six hours after a load. We've gotten, I've gotten much better at it in the last six to eight months and much better at teaching it. Amazing. You know, to that point about teaching, you wrote an article and you mentioned this earlier about this idea of coaching style similar to, um, to uh, uh, love languages, right? Yes. So um, can, you, can you share with our audience here, how can mentors and coaches, how, do they, how can they become better? You know, how, how can they be the best? How can they adapt to, to, being, uh, to being the best they can be? It's a great question and I wish I had the definitive answer. I do think it can be codified and we're creating a tool uh, with surveys of the student to tell us what they think is their teaching or coachable language. So we can tailor our coaching to it, but it's a two end street. Who's to say that I'm the best teacher to someone who needs a lot of positive reinforcement. You know, my culture of my father was work harder. You're a stupid jackass. What the hell are you doing? I love that. That works for me, but for some people they crumble. So I may be the worst teacher for someone that wants all positive language, but really good for someone who likes to be whipped. On the other hand, how do we know that person likes to be whipped? So we need two tools that are, that are accurate. We don't have them yet. And that is what is the, the student's optimal language to learn? And then what is the coach's optimal language to teach? And can that coach use all the clubs in the bag at the right time? Because we all are a mixture, just like love languages, or sometimes you want words of endearment and sometimes you want physical touch. If you, you need all of the clubs. It's when do you play each club and how do you then teach teachers to do it and how do you teach the student to be receptive to it? So it's not just their inherent bias and we all have unconscious biases for learning, but then to teach them how to respond better to that club and then to realize that was the right club. You put a hole in the pulmonary artery, we are going to whip you. It shouldn't happen. And you should realize that's a risk and that is your fault. Wake the hell up. So there's, you know, there's multiple ways to play it. It's a fascinating topic, and um, you're really at the frontier of this in terms of uh, developing this idea of eight coaching styles and or eight coachability styles. Right, right? coachability. So, yeah. so, you know, great work there. Um, okay, here's a question from the audience. Um, how, how can a surgeon, how do you create a culture of where a surgeon is comfortable asking a surgeon who has more experience for help with a critical or difficult aspect of the surgery. I love it. Here's what we did at NYU. You fail if you have a complication and don't have your partner in the room. So that's the ultimate failure is to have a bad outcome and not call for help. So instead of being like when I was a resident, it was weakness to call for help. Now we will ding you 
Uh, we may even put you on suspension or probation if you have a bad outcome in the OR and didn't call for help. So we more than encourage it. In addition, we now, when we present cases on our Friday morning, we say that's, a, that's an operation where we're gonna have two attendings in the room. Uh, and we can tell up front, you know, we just, uh, when I do my robotic pneumonectomies and I've only done maybe four or five, I have Dr. Zervos, Mike Zervos in the room with me, we do it together. I know it's a high risk case and I want his expertise and experience there. And he probably does the same with me, but not to the same extent. So we're both in each other's rooms and we're doing difficult cases. We used to do it for immunotherapy. Now we've gotten used to operating after immunotherapy. But at first, we were in each other's rooms where all the people who had post-induction radiation or immunotherapy. Now we do it for pneumonectomy. So it's, it's a partnership. His results are mine, mine are his. We're a three-star lobectomy program. There's only six or seven hospitals in the United States and North America that have it. We want to keep it. We're a team. And then we can even put revenue and bonuses to team outcomes, not individuals. Meaning if an individual does great, but the team doesn't win the Stanley Cup, there ain't no money for that individual, even though maybe he scored 120 goals that year. All of a sudden now the team goals make more, uh, have more importance than individuals. So it's tying goals together, both from revenue, financial, awards. We're all just the team. That's all we are. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's moving from this idea of individual performance to broadening it to the team and then raising the team's performance. Right. Because, um, you know, you're relying on the team to, for a successful. Um, and, 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 if, and if I have a great year, but I know I'm not going to get my quote bonus unless the weakest link of my team performs at X, I'm going to make damn sure they're performing at X because I want that bonus. So, you know, it's not just money, but that's a, that's a hard granular example that people connect with quickly. Uh, it is about the team because outcomes in surgery rely on the nurse, the patient, uh, the physical therapist, all of these things. We're all in it together. And I think one of the reasons I came to NYU Langone is they really get that message that it's metricized about great patient outcomes and it takes everybody, not the silo of the surgeon, just in the OR. Although that's a critical part of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Thank you for that. A couple quick more questions for you, Dr. Serfolio. Um, so, you know, you talk about super performers really planning for all eventualities, all scenarios. You know, that's, um, that's what distinguishes super performers from good. And so was there anything around COVID that was unexpected or that you really had, the, that was hard to anticipate or any, um, how, how did COVID-19, you know, impact the planning? around surgery and any learnings about that going forward? A lot. So my role as a COO was with the greatest honor of my life. I got to come into this hospital every day for 101 days to round every day in the Manhattan hospital where we had the majority of the COVID patients. We had 1,300 in our healthcare system. I think at one point four or 500 here in our Manhattan campus. I got to round every day with the smartest doctors in the world. And I was able to then tell, to try to understand what they said and we told our intensivists at other hospitals, both in Brooklyn, Long Island, and we all were a team. Uh, it completely changed um, how our system was integrated. It was very integrated, but we put it on steroids. And um, it just shows what human beings can do when they all are on the same team. I mean, the, the heroes, the nurses and doctors that went in the room, we started doing trakes and Bronx before anybody. We took a lot of national criticism. Now everybody's copying what we did. So it was an amazing story and I was honored to be a part of it to serve. I served the doctors and nurses here, made sure they had the equipment, the PPE, the antibiotics, the ventilators. It was an unbelievable story. And uh, we're reporting now the, the best survival in the world of COVID patients. I hope to get it published soon. It's already at a couple of journals. We have, I think the greatest outcomes ever reported. I heard Emory's is close but this was all about a team. And you wanna talk where nurses make a difference and physical therapists and respiratory therapists make a difference? Have someone on the vent for four months and have them walk out of the hospital with no pressure injuries. That ain't the doctor, that's the nurse, that's the team. Absolutely. Yeah, we really have to uh, give kudos to NYU and to uh, all of the staff and all of the healthcare workers uh, around the country that you know working so hard and have worked so hard on um, you know, every day showing up for, for patients. So, so thank you um, for that. And our last question, Dr. Serfolio, um, you know, with your role as a leader, as a surgeon, as an educator, as a family man, 
any tips for our audience on how to juggle all of those aspects, yeah. all, all of these areas of life? I'll give you my two cents on it. And I think, you know, the work-life balance has a fulcrum. And all of us may put the fulcrum in different spots. It's really funny. My middle son said to me uh, about a year ago, what the hell are you writing about work-life balance? You have no idea. You're in the work-life. isn't well, it's balanced for me, bro. So it's balanced for me. But when you were five or six, I got home at 5.30. Remember, batting practice was at 5. The game started at 5.30. So I would leave work at 4. And I was doing 10 operations a day. So then my arrow was closer to home. I think the point is it's dynamic. It's fluid. Your work-life balance changes as you change. Uh, as who's at home changes. As the time, they, their age, how much they need you, uh, where you are in life, what your roles are. And it's not, there's no right answer. It's never balanced in a typical day. People don't even like the work, 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 work life balance. They've all changed it to other vernaculums, but it is taking care of yourself. So I do think it's critical that you exercise and you eat well and you sleep well. I think those are the things that we don't do as surgeons. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the people around you. And so when people start saying it's selfish, I say, okay, if you really love the people around you, you gotta take care of yourself in order for you to have some peace to love them. I always say, if you bring home leftovers, then you haven't done the job. You can't bring home yourself as a leftover. You have to be an entree that's ready to serve in your roles at home when you walk in the door. And if it's 10.30 at night and you're burnt out from work, it's gonna to be tough to be successful at home. So all of those things, forgive yourself. There may be some bad days where you're a bad spouse or parent, but you make it up the next day. I love it. I love the, the analogy to uh, an entree versus leftover. That's great. <laughs> it's not mine. I stole it from someone, <laughs> but it's, it works. That's all right. We'll let you take credit for it. So thank you so much, Dr. Schiffel. I want to just summarize real quick a few of the key points that I think you've covered today and that we can you know, maybe um, leave for our audience as key takeaways. Number one, feedback is a gift, that we should find the nuggets of wisdom in all feedback, no matter the source. Two, that there's different teaching languages, there's different ways that trainees respond to coaching and feedback, and that program directors should adapt their teaching style to the individual to achieve more receptiveness, to achieve the results, the best results for, for, um, for the trainee and, and for the attending. Number three, there is no better way to prepare for an operation than to watch it. And we've seen with the polling today that a lot of, a lot of surgeons are incorporating that, which is great. So leveraging video review to hone your technique, to learn different styles and add to your toolbox. And then lastly, number four, surgeons should see coaching like professional athletes do. Anything to add to that, Dr. Serpoli? Oh, and I, I would just say the final thing is uh, that surgeons that are listening, we're too hard on ourselves. I mean, sometimes we get bad outcomes and did a really good operation and it's just life. And I think um, we have to avoid being the second victim. It happens all the time because nobody cares about the surgeon when the patient dies, everyone goes to the patient, then medical legal or HR calls you what happened and they, then you're lawyering up, but no one worries about your heart and your soul, we do. So we, we talk to our, any of our staff, nurses, doctors, as soon as they're a bad outcome, not about what happened or blame, how are they doing emotionally, physically, spiritually? Forgive yourself, even if you made a horrible error, and even if that patient's death was your fault, you gave the wrong medicine, you, you did the bad operation, whatever it is, don't become a second victim. This is something that we have to do a better job with, that we, uh, we don't forgive ourselves very well. We only remember our failures. All the surgeons are, who are listening know that. We don't remember the 15 or 17,000 that did well. You remember the one or two that didn't. Uh, and we, we got to work on that a little bit. Excellent. Well, that's, that's great suggestion and great recommendation. So thank you. And we appreciate you and we appreciate all of our surgeons and the surgical community for everything that you all do every day um, um, in your work. And so Dr. Serfolio, thank you on behalf of CSATS and our attendees today. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you and to learn from you on this timely and important subject. Your thought leadership is invaluable. I know I've taken away a lot from this conversation and I'm confident our audience has too. To our audience, thank you for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and questions on surgical training in today's challenging environment. So okay. lastly, let's stay connected. 
If you're not yet a part of our Surgeon Exclusive community, you can join and get access to a robust video library of 11,000 plus vetted case videos and a network of surgical peers and experts. Go to CSATS.com forward slash basic. We're going to post a link to that in the chat box and sign up today at no charge. So thank you all for tuning in. We look forward to staying in touch. And thank you to our esteemed guest, Dr. Serfolio. And I want to thank your audience for their time. My great honor to have the time of so many surgeons. Thank you, Israel. Thank you. Bye-bye.